Hello everyone, I'm Fabio Scala from Further Africa. Welcome to another entrepreneur panel of In for Africa, a movement to raise awareness as we fight COVID-19 across the continent. Today, I have the great pleasure to be talking to three really cool ladies leading their own businesses in Africa. Salihat Rahman from Abaya Lagos, a fashion company in Nigeria. Uh, Maria Lisa Emmanuel from Fama Africa Distribution, a digital classifies portal in Namibia and Mary Asanga from Kutuma Enterprise, a producer of peanut snacks in Nigeria. Welcome, ladies, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank, thank you for having us. Great, great to see you all again. Great to uh, see you too. So I wanted to start this conversation by getting a glance uh, of uh, how you're being affected um, by COVID-19. Uh, what's different today on your business and your sector because of it? Uh, did you have to reinvent yourself? Did you, have, did you have to reinvent your company in any way? And uh, how are you bouncing back? Uh, Maria, let's start with you. Uh, I think that digital is an area uh, that has been key for businesses. So I wanted to start to get some of your views, please. Me? Yes, you, Maria? Because the, the network went a bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I missed, I missed a part there. So yeah, so let's start with your views on the, you know, how um, you're re reinventing your business and how you've been impacted, both you and your sector, uh, by COVID-19. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for me, I'm really looking at it from the different sectors that I'm in. Um, I'm starting to call myself a serial entrepreneur <laughs> because I'm so many in the different sector, I'm diversified. So first on my music side, um, we've, we've really been affected because we, we go out to make events to perform for people to make money. And when, when the lockdown came, we were probably the most affected, um, um, especially the arts and culture affected people. But I think with the digital um, economy, it sort of just pulled us back to the, to the online and we started making concerts online. I actually had a, a concert with Sound City Africa uh, two weekends ago where I went live on their Instagram account, which have about half a million people to, 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 it's based in Nigeria, but I mean, it's an African platform for music. And, and that's really how we are reinventing ourselves to go more on social media and to tap into the followings that we have to, to, to reach our clients because everybody's online, but they are not outside because, you know, the, the economy is locked down. So, so that's for one. And, and the second one, um, I mean, the cosmetic sector, and I think that, I was lucky because the cosmetic sector was declared an essential services, but it didn't really mean that I was lucky because I needed to change the model from supplying salons to trying to go online and where people just order and, and you have to drop off and suddenly you have to invest in transport or you have to charge transport and you have to, to sort of be creative around what was allowed to move as essential services to deliver your, your, your product. Um, so that's one. And the Vama distribution really encouraged me to, to, you know, to, to invest more time in that platform because it's really a digital platform where I want to capture the um, manufacturers in Africa to be visible to the trading, you know, to the trading system and um, specifically targeted for the intra-Africa trade that is about to, to go into force now in the continent. So again, it comes back to the digital economy and I, I, I know we'll go into that as we go. Um, and, 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 and also the challenges and the goodness of what it is right now, and not just to look at it from a crisis point of view, but how do we suddenly now change our model and perspective to, to the current situation. So I'll end here for now. Right, thank you, Maria. Uh, now, Salia, uh, how's the business of fashion handling? You, you're uh, mute, Salia. Just... Oh, I, I don't know why I keep doing that, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Fashion in Nigeria, hmm. so it really depends on the perspective from which you look at it. Um, my business is a bit of a niche business, and um, so for me, there was, there was a lot of questions that I needed to ask myself. So did I want to sort of push forward, or did I want to just sort of step back? Um, it, I, I needed to just, uh, because of my setup, we didn't... I figured we, I looked at it and we didn't just have the capacity to sort of 
push in and start to do things like, you know, to pivot the way, you know, Maria's cosmetic, um, um, you know, company did. Uh, so some companies went ahead to do things like face masks and, you know, um, PPEs for uh, medical frontliners. Um, we just decided, well, I decided that because we didn't have the capacity, we're in a niche business and it's a luxury uh, brand. So we didn't have the capacity or the resources to put together to do that sort of mass production um, exercise. So it was better for us to just sort of lean back and then see what it is that we can do within the company that can prepare us for post COVID. So like Maria said, it's IT, it's social media, it's really taking advantage of what we can use and which really is the digital space. So we reached out on Instagram, we've refurbished our website, we're trying to get to know our customers even better. Um, questions even, the question even came up as to, do we even diversify? So are we, di are we diversifying in terms of um, our customer segmentation, you know, we're originally a, uh, originally a luxury brand, so are we going to now add on a different segment of customers? It's starting to show little by little, and um, at the end of this phase, we will then be able to take a proper decision as to who it is that we're serving. Are we staying true to our main target market, or are we going to diversify in terms of segmentation? You know, I mean, there's just a lot of things that this situation has kind of opened up, um, it's opened our eyes to a lot of things, to a lot of realizations. Um, we've had to really look inwards and see how we can restructure our organization so that we're ready for post-COVID. Because I know that there's going to be a lot of changes, it's going to be a whole new normal, et cetera. Right, thank you. Uh, Phoenix, what are your thoughts? Uh, Mary, do, oh, oh, we lost Mary. Okay, just one second, guys. Let's see if she marries coming back. Um, well, you know what? Uh, while we wait for Mary to reconnect, um, you know, it's very interesting that, uh, you know, you are facing different challenges and you are handling it differently. Uh, however, one thing that we have in common are the, uh, the digital platforms. Oops, so there you go. We have Mary back again. Uh, so, Mary, what are your thoughts? How have you been impacted uh, by the virus? Did you reinvent your business? What's what what changed? Well, a lot, of, a lot, a lot has changed from the revenue, sales, operations, and everything. Since I said the raw, the prices of raw materials here in Nigeria has actually tripled. So it's kind of very happening to the market. Getting the at the of this period is to ensure that um, I keep in touch with my customers to preserve the relationship and also to build trust. Because I feel and I believe that um, in the course of all of this, it's definitely going to fade. But how well am I able to preserve the relationship and then everything over would be able to go back to how we used to be or even better. So I know that the, the current situation on, at hand is really affecting a lot, but then, and then talking about the digital space, I know it's one thing to actually be out there, but then it's another thing to commit your goods and services to your consumers. So I also believe that if um, plans are being made to make all of this work hand in hand, to also favor other sectors of the small and medium enterprise, I think it's going to be a good one. All right, thank you, Mary. While I lost you there for a second, I was just saying that it's very interesting to see how uh, a lot of the challenges are being addressed uh, using digital platforms. So uh, to keep that on that subject, I wanted to ask uh, how you guys see digital as, as one of the key ways that uh, we're using uh, to, uh, to fight coronavirus in the continent. Uh, Salihat, what do you think? Let me start with you. Yeah, um, I've always felt that especially within, you know, I mean, I can speak for my geographical location better. Um, in, this, in these parts, I think there's a lot to do with education and trust. Um, so you'll find that not many people trust what is being, 
you know, what is the information that is being given to the public. Not many people are really buying into the idea of stay at home, you know, keep safe and all of that. I mean, understandably, because, you know, our economy is one of those where you have the majority of our masses living day to day. So if they don't go out, they cannot eat. Um, and so there's that catch-22 situation where, you know, how do, are, are we going to stay at home and starve? Are we going to go out? So I think that, you know, with the digital, um, with the, so now being forced to stay at home has forced us to go digital. Those of us that were not particularly in the digital space, I think it's important because we're able to reach more people with more education, more information. We're able to, you know, save money. Um, the corporations, for instance, can keep a lot of their staff at home um, and they can be more productive working from a distance than actually coming into work. Saves money rent space, saves money um, in terms of transporting staff from their homes to work. You find that the commercial center of uh, Lagos, where I am, for instance, is like a way away from most of the satellite towns where most working forces um, live. So, you know, do you want to spend eight hours coming to work and then another eight hours going home? It's just sort of forced us to see that people can work smarter, corporations can save money, you know, and information can get to the furthest parts of, you know, the country better. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's been a very good eye opener and I think it's something that has been a force for change and positive change at that. Right, thank you for that. Mary, I know that you're also in Nigeria, but you're not in Lagos, so it'll be interesting to have your views. Uh, how do you see digital as one of the key ways uh, to fight coronavirus? Okay, so um, the digital space has actually been very, very impactful in fighting the coronavirus. Currently, here in my um, current location, I know that um, it's kind of remote and we know too many persons are not very, very familiar with the digital platform. But then it's also an eye opener because um, at this point, so many things, most of the meetings, most of the, um, the event and engagement has always been on digital platform. So I felt and I feel that like it actually um, opened so many persons, especially young people here to the digital space and how well they could actually utilize it to grow their businesses, to grow their presence and also cost their business to actually get the visibility that they actually want. But then I also know that one thing would always um, remain, which is the digital platform will remain for as long as. So it's now left for, uh, for us to actually utilize this opportunity to go out there and make the impact we want, create the relationship we want and also build it at the same time. All right, Maria, I'm a digital pro. So, what what do you think? On the sorry, I was now out. <laughs> oh no, no problem. So the, uh, the question is, uh, you know, how do you see uh, uh, an impact of digital in fighting coronavirus? Um, yeah, I mean, yesterday when I I, I, I had to attend a, a e learning platform uh, that a uh, young group of people were were launching. And they were actually also launching it digitally because uh, we are allowed to only have 10 people. Um, and so they, they are launching the e-learning <laughs> uh, in, in, in this way, online streaming to everybody. But I think within the education sector, you see that suddenly we are talking about e-learning and how because the kids cannot go to, to school for a while, they still need to, to continue learning. And the digital platform obviously is the was the first thing to say, how do we start getting e-learning? Probably too late to start looking at how to start e-learning when you most need it in this time. But at least it made, especially the government serious to say they must invest in, in digital infrastructure, just as important already for the fourth industrial revolution that we are in, but also to aggressively deliberately have it because you know, um, it's a wake up call uh, because of the pandemic. And, it, and it's quite interesting for me in that way. And also in the health sector itself, um, I did an article um, um, that I wrote for a magazine. And already when the pandemic started in, in Wuhan, 
I started tracking it in Wuhan and then it got into, in, into Japan was the second part and then it got into Europe. And how it was moving, you could see already that the tech startup were, were already trying to get solution on how to the first, probably the first digital thing was the tracker that was all over that way you could track the, the, the virus as it, as it can get confirmed in each country. And you find that every country started sort of inventing its own tracker so that the public can actually see how it's going. Now they are talking about uh, contact tracing and the way, only way um, the, the two giants, the Apple and the Google, are trying to create a software which is on your phone. And when you go around and one day you are confirmed to have uh, coronavirus, it sort of notify everybody somehow who was around you. So that you see all these different inventions that are coming in the health sector, in the education sector, and of course on the business side, and this is why we're here, the SME, I think we, we all you know, really, really saw that importance of the digital platform and how we are all reinventing ourselves to get on the platform. So really to go out, we, we, and, and also interestingly, at the government level, you find that people cannot come and, and, and have a cabinet session. And you see, I think um, Rwanda President Paul Kagame was the first guy who hosted an investment, um, online investment that had uh, around 500 people attend. So business has to continue and we can't wait for the flights to start and for the events to get, but we still, business has to continue. And the only way platform is really, really this platform. I see. No, no I agree with you. Uh, and, uh, you know, another point is resilience. Resilience, resilience is, is a strong feature of most African businesses. So uh, starting with Salihad, I know that fashion is a business with very particular challenges. So let me ask you first, as an entrepreneur, what are the lessons or perhaps the main lesson that you take away from this experience or that you are taking away? Um, I, I guess, you know, I, I, I learned a lot. I, I, I can't, I, I'm trying to, you know, if I want to pinpoint one profound lesson that I'm taking away from this is that anything can change at any time, you know. Um, that, that is the one constant thing, it is change. And um, you, as a business owner, you can't afford to um, be a deer in headlights for too long. Um, it's okay to just sort of pause and, you know, take stock of, you know, what's happening around you. But then at the same time, you know, as a business owner, you must always expect that there will be some form of change to come at some point in time or the other. So it's really just to position your company in such a way that there is that flexibility to be able to maneuver at times where change just sort of hits you, you know. Um, that's been a big lesson for me, you know, to, to really just position my company in such a way that we are that flexible, that we can just sort of maneuver and, um, and, and, and coast and, or, or ride the wave as it were. Yeah. All right. Okay, and uh, what do you have to say about this? biggest lesson? Mary, can you hear me? Maria. Okay, Mary. Mary. Okay. Mary. Um, so one of the biggest lessons I learned is to um, make adequate plans for unforeseen circumstances, um, because nobody ever thought that the pandemic would actually hit this way, and no one ever thought that. To last this long, to put plans in place for the the good and every other situation that comes is actually one way to move forward because it prepares you step ahead. And even if you have to be affected or one would be affected, it wouldn't be as much as when you didn't have any prior preparation. So I just feel and I know that as um uh, as an SME, it is very important to put plans in place for the unforeseen circumstances. All right, Maria, I know you're involved in some business. Interesting to hear from you. Biggest lessons? Um, I think I will really copy from Salihat. This um, of working together, the solidarity, I think suddenly we saw how it became so easy to look at the next person and to see how you can assist. And that. that we could 
conquer anything if we come together because we wanted to make sure that we we fight this thing that was threatening all of us, threatening our livelihood and lifestyle. Um, so this working together solidarity concept, and it was also interesting as you saw it around the world, the different initiative people were coming up with, different um, funding, you know, uh, you know, the, the artists getting into the funding concept, fund this and, and trying to help even especially the less vulnerable. And you wonder that when business was normal, as if we didn't, you know, pay attention that some people needed help. And, 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 and I think maybe just that wake up call to say we have to continue then that, uh, you know, pulling together, holding hands. Um, that would, for me, really one of the biggest lessons and, 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 and as we go, teaching us really to be you know, passionate about everything else and trying to work together to, to overcome anything. Right, thank you, Maria. Post, basically post this. Oh, sorry, you put it off over there. Sorry about that. Um, but very powerful message, ladies, thank you. Uh, I honestly believe that small business owners uh, in Africa are trying to do their best uh, to survive, to keep their, their heads above water. Now, uh, respecting the differences among African countries, uh, should governments allocate more resources to help entrepreneur? Uh, Mary, what do you think? Or Marie, what do you think? Um, okay, so outrightly, I would actually say governments should allocate more resources to helping SMEs. But then with the current pandemic and also knowing that they also have um, a lot on their plate, it is also very important that we also try to help ourselves because I know that out there, there are lots of um, um, opportunities other services that will help the businesses actually thrive. So, um, yeah, I actually say, I would say government should allocate resources, but also the SMEs should also uh, like make intentional efforts to also do what they can to get what they want to. Right, Salia, what's your take? More resources. Well, you know, I, I've, I've always said, you know, that if, if it's, I mean, it's one thing to, what's worth doing is always worth doing well. Um, I like the idea of resources. I mean, hey, we're all a small, we're all SMEs as far as I'm concerned. Um, the backbone of our economy really is based on SMEs. Um, so, you know, but we have the challenge of infrastructure, you know, um, in Nigeria, for instance, we don't have adequate in infrastructure that can support SMEs, you know. So grants are great, uh, you know, I, I prefer grants to loans. Um, grants are always great and, you know, facilities are good, but what are we using these um, facilities for? If we're getting, you know, a, a grant or a facility of how many hundred thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, um, are we using all of it towards adding value to our businesses or are we using a whole lump of it to create our own infrastructure you know um so i'm I, I always i almost feel like it's taking two steps forward and three steps back um so for me it's more importantly um laying the infrastructure there for us to ride on i think that people can businesses can thrive or Rather, businesses can thrive and they can kick off on very little if the infrastructure is there. So that's that's my take on it. I, I think you know, it, give facilities and resources without the infrastructure is like filling, trying to fill a bucket, uh, trying to fill a basket with water. Yeah, that's my take. I hear you. Now, I couldn't finish this conversation without asking you for your personal vision to a future past this virus. So in a sentence, uh, how do you Africa uh, post COVID-19? Uh, Marie? Um, yes, just keeping a positive mind, of course. Um, we've, we've done so good. I mean, we're probably ambushed by this, but we came out good. So my post COVID beyond this really is just to, for me to invest in the digital uh, businesses that I'm, that I'm currently setting up. Um, I'm really passionate about this and I want in the next three years to five years to create a, a Alibaba of Africa for, for businesses. Wow, strong statement. I've seen your platform, so I know you're on your way there. Uh, um, let's go with uh, Mary now. Mary, your take. How do you Africa post COVID-19? 
case of life, I actually know that everything will fall back into place and everything will definitely make sense when all of this is over. So one of the things I've tried doing personally is to make intentional efforts to network right and also to grow my skills and also my knowledge on how to build a sustainable food system because one of my ambition is to actually build a brand that is sustainable and also create um, impact. So that's my take. All right, Salia, your take. How do you uh, Africa post COVID-19? Um, I want to interact more. Um, I want to, I want to truly, truly see and feel the world as a, as a global village. Where we're a lot more. I mean, our degrees of separation is is that much smaller now that uh, we've been forced into this digital space. You know, um, so I want to I want to interact more. I want to reach out more. I want to. I want to basically spread. I want. I want to turn into an octopus and just spread my tentacles. You know, a lot, a lot more. And that's how I really see us post COVID. I think that if we can just sort of integrate the way we should as Africa, you know, we can be a real, a real economic, um, a real economic force globally. Right. So my question is that we're going to have in Africa the next Alibaba. It's going to be sustainable. That's Marie, right? That Mary, I mean, and uh, yeah. it's going to be fully integrated with a lot of harmony, thanks to Salihar. So that's that's what we're looking at, guys. Great, perfect. Quite a combination of visions that we have to look forward to. Ladies, it's been a great privilege to talk to you today. I had so much fun. It was spectacular spending this time. Thank you very much for your views, and most importantly, uh, thank you for your support for uh, you know, in for Africa. Mary, Salihat, Maria, good to see you. Thank you so much. Your last words. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you for having us. Thank you, thank you very much, Fabio. Thank you so much, and nice meeting you, ladies. Thank you, Fabio, and it's also nice meeting you, Salihat. Thank you on your WhatsApp, ladies. Oh, well, 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 welcome. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you. Uh, and uh, for you uh, watching this video, thank you for supporting In for Africa. Don't forget to follow us for more great content. Uh, take care.